In this video, we're going to take a look at hypothesis testing for two dependent variables. And specifically, we're going to look at what's called the paired t-test. Sometimes this is also called the dependent samples t-test or match paired uh, t-test depending on the text or the professor that you're using. So recall the purpose of a hypothesis test is to evaluate a claim about a population parameter. And this hypothesis test, we're specifically going to look at uh, what we do when we deal with dependent variables using specifically the paired t-test. So there are some assumptions or conditions that we have to meet in order to perform the, the hypothesis test using the paired t-test. The first one is that we have two dependent quantitative variables, and we're really interested in the differences when we do this hypothesis test. The second condition is randomization was used to gather the data. The third condition has the two parts just like before. The sample size is at least 30, and I'm going to use the, the um, notation n with the subscript script of d because we're talking about the number of differences being at least 30 or the population distribution is approximately normal for the differences. Now, if you've seen videos of mine before, you'll notice that um, I have the left tail, the two tail, and the right tail tests identified there. Probably the one difference is when we talk about our mu sub zero value, we're predominantly going to be using zero when we talk about the population mean for the differences. So that mu sub zero is generally going to be zero when we do this hypothesis test. Other than that, it's the same idea with the hypothesis statements from what we talked about before. Now, here's the one thing that's really different with this test versus other tests is before we begin the test, we have to calculate the differences. And the way that we calculate these differences is going to determine how we set up our alternative hypothesis. So you have to kind of think about how you're going to do the subtraction before you write the hypothesis statement in order to get at what our problem or our scenario is getting at for the particular problem we're dealing with. Once you calculate the differences, this is the test statistic for um, the hypothesis test on the differences or the paired t-test. And you'll notice this ex looks exactly like a one sample t-test. If you think about it, really once you calculate and come up with the value of the differences, it really reduces to a one sample t-test, except for mu sub zero is generally going to be the value of zero. And then our degrees of freedom are n minus one, or the number of differences minus one. So let's take a look at an example and see how we work through a problem that deals with the paired t-test. So the example is going to be in black, and then the solutions are going to be in the blue color, so you can kind of differentiate between the two. But the scenario is this. We're studying the effectiveness of a software update used to reduce system failures for a computer operating system. The initial system failures before were measured by counting the number of operating system failures during a one-week period. After the one-week period, a software update was installed, and six weeks later, the operating system failures were counted, uh, which we're calling after during that six week. Uh, we'd like to know at the 0.01 level of significance if the software update results in fewer system failures on average. So in this case right here, we're dealing with uh, paired data. So down here in this table, I have the computer. This is our categorical variable right here. And then the system failures before and system failures after are the dependent quantitative variables. So we have two dependent quantitative variables. These two measurements right here depend on what computer we took that information from. So I want to really uh, emphasize this, but this is paired data. We don't want to sort the data or anything like that. Otherwise, what ends up happening is we might end up matching up the system failures before from computer A to maybe the system failures after from computer D. So we have to make sure that we're not sorting the data and we're keeping the pairs uh, locked in together. Now, one of the things that we have to decide is how we're going to decide to do the subtraction, all right? So I kind of already explained that right here, but really, let's look at the question that we're getting after. So we'd like to know if the software update results in fewer system failures on average. So in other words, when we measured the before, we're hoping these values over here are larger than these values over here, okay? So in other words, there's fewer system failures after we installed the software patch. For this column. So there's two ways that we could do this subtraction. We could do before minus after, or we could do after minus before. Now, since we're talking about fewer system failures, um, I would probably have the preference of doing after minus before. That would give us negative numbers, and so we would expect the six system failures to be less than zero or negative values. So when we look at these differences right here, when we do the after minus before, you can see that we have uh, predominantly negative values right there. 
and now we want to see if it's statistically significant. So from this point forward, we're really using this derived column that we got based on how we set up the subtraction, and we're doing the analysis using these differences. So you'll notice over here in the summary statistics, I'm using the differences right here in order to calculate the mean, the standard deviation, uh, our sample size. Those are some of the values that we'll use in order to do the analysis of. So let's take a look at the conditions and make sure we satisfy those before we go on. So first we have two quantitative variables that are dependent and we're interested in the differences. So the quantitative variables are system failures before and system failures after which depend on the computer name. The differences, I'm going to define those here, are system failures after minus system failures before. And then mu sub d is going to represent the average of all differences in system failures. Randomization was used to gather the data, so to handle this what we might do is if we had 100 computers at our place of business, we might randomly select maybe 30 or 40 of those computers to implement the software patch on to do this study is the sample size at least 30 for the differences. So in this case, our sample size was eight, so we don't meet that criteria right there. So we have to check and see if the population distribution is approximately normal for the differences. Since we don't have the population distribution, we're gonna take a look at the sample and use that to approximate the population. And specifically, again, we're looking at the differences when we do this, we're gonna create the box plot and the histogram. Since our sample size is really small, I probably would not use the histogram in this case because there's some issues with small sample sizes in creating a histogram, but I'm presenting it just so we're aware of uh, the two graphics that we might look at, all right? So our box plot, when we take a look at this, we can clearly see that we have one outlier on the left-hand side. Um, if you were to draw the, uh, the whisker out to that edge right there, it looks fairly symmetrical, maybe some slight left skewness when we look at that. When we look at the histogram, it appears to be unimodal. And again, we see that life, uh, left skewness going on when we take a look at this distribution right here. So maybe it's not exactly normal. Maybe it's not uh, really that close to being approximately normal, but for right now, we're gonna say it's good enough in order to go through and do the analysis. The next step is to state our null and our alternative hypothesis. So if you recall from above, I said we wanna determine if, if the software patch was effective in reducing system failures. So that word reducing really is getting at, getting at are the system failures going down or are they less than what they were before. So we're gonna use mu sub d is less than zero and that's how we set up the subtraction to match up with this, okay? And then h sub zero would be mu sub d is greater than or equal to zero. And again, you could use uh, just mu sub d is equal to zero if you like as well. So this is going to be a left tail test. Our rejection region is in the left side. Our alpha value is on the left side. The fail to reject region is on the right side. And now we're ready to go through and calculate our level of significance, our test statistic, and our p-value. The problem statement above gave us our alpha value, which is 0.01. Our sample size was eight, so to calculate our degrees of freedom, those are gonna be eight minus one, which gives us a value of seven. Our test statistic, is t star is equal to the mean of the differences. Some, some texts will use d bar rather than x bar sub d. My preference is to use the x bar sub d minus mu sub zero, that's gonna be the value in the hypothesis statement, which is zero. And then it's gonna be the standard deviation of the differences divided by the square root of the number of differences that we have, okay? So when we plug those values in, which we got from the summary statistics above, we end up with a test statistic of negative 3.291. And we have to determine whether this is a lower bound or an upper bound in order to calculate our p-value. Since this ends up on the left side of zero, and we want to find the area to the left of that, the arrow in the h sub a is pointing to the left, that means we want to go from that value of negative 3.291 to the left. So that means our lower bound is going to be negative infinity our upper bound is going to be the negative 3.291, which is going to be somewhere over here. And then we need our degrees of freedom as well, which are going to be seven. So you can see I plugged those values into the TCDF function. And this is the function we're gonna be using on the TI-84 graphing calculator. And when I plug those values in, I end up with a p-value of 0 0.0066. So that's a fairly small p-value. Once we get done with this, we're gonna take a look at the decision rule. The decision rule has never changed for any of the hypothesis tests that I've, I've showed you in other videos. We're always gonna follow the p-value approach. And the decision rule is if our p-value is less than our alpha value, then we reject h sub zero. 
So since our p-value of 0 0.0066 is less than our alpha value of 0 0.01, we will reject our null hypothesis, meaning um, there, there's evidence to support H sub A. So when we get down to the conclusion statement, we're going to say there is sufficient evidence to support that the software update was effective in reducing system failures on average in the population. So that's just a generic statement that we can use when we're stating the conclusion. And I think that ties back nicely with the original problem statement that just about anybody would be able to understand.